Perfect. So hello, everyone, and welcome to our OTS webinar. My name is Erin, and uh, Ronald is our co-host as well. And today we have two uh, speakers who are actually OTS Board of Director trainee representatives. So I'll introduce them just very briefly by name, uh, and they'll then they'll introduce themselves when they speak. Um, so our first speaker will be Orly, and our second speaker will be Leonora. So Orly, go ahead. Yes. Okay, I think everything should be working by now. So hi everyone, my name is Aurélie. Uh, as Erin just mentioned, I'm one of the four junior representatives at the board of the OTS. Uh, I did my PhD at McGill with Hannah Disleman and I'm now a senior scientist and Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at Six Hole Bioscience. And so today I'm gonna be presenting the work I've been doing over the past last years, uh, playing with nucleic acid nanostructure and nanotechnology to improve oligonucleotid uh, therapeutics delivery. So I was first introduced to the DNA nanotechnology field back in 2013, 2014, when I first met Hanadi and discovered her work, uh, she became my PhD supervisor and I was very lucky to do my PhD at McGill in her lab. And so what Hanadi lab is, is doing is using DNA as a building block to self-assemble nano object. And so I think really uh, eight years ago when I discovered that we could use DNA as a material to build structure, I was just fascinated. By, by the field and decided to uh, put a few years of my work onto it. And so how do we do this? Uh, well, what we can do is just use the properties of DNA itself. So we know that uh, if we have two complementary strands, they can recognize each other because of, of sequence specificity. And so we can simply imagine that by redesigning the sequence of DNA, we can start making more than two strands coming together. You have here an example of a four-way junction that is made of four strands. And you can take this idea even further by imagining that by lengthening the strand of those, those oligonucleotides, you could trigger a self-assembly of bigger, larger 2Ds array. And so basically the field of nucleic acid nanotechnology has just evolved so much over the past uh, few years. And I think it's fair now to say that we can achieve quite easily all kind of shape and structure by playing with, with DNA or RNA. And it goes really from small wireframe nanostructure to more large micrometer uh, compact structure made of DNA origami or DNA bricks. And so we really do have this advantage compared to other nanotechnology-based approach that we can control everything very, very precisely and make all kind of size and, and shape of, of structure. So uh, in Hanadi's lab, uh, one of the main focus was the development of DNA minimal nanostructure. And I put here an example of one of the structure that I worked a lot with, and I always like to see the video, so it's always nice to see it at, le at least twice. Uh, but you see here a DNA nanocube that is formed of only four different strands uh, made of 96 bases. And the, the very nice thing about it is that it can quantitatively assemble in one pot. So it just basically mix all the strands together in magnesium containing buffer, and you can form these structure that are very monodispersed in size. And so, uh, you can use different techniques to characterize the structure. I've put here two of the main techniques that we use. Uh, the first one is looking at electrophoresis, so using page. And you can see here the sequential assembly. So when we put one strand, two strand, three strand, and the fourth one to form the cube, really showing that we have the right connectivity of the structure. And we can use uh, dynamic light scattering to confirm the size of the and the monodispersity of the structure. So if we look even closer at the structure, we can see that there are a single stranded region on top and on the bottom of the cube. I'll show it here again. We can see it here. And so that basically allow us to come and uh, position the complementary strand. Uh, and so in, in this video, you don't have anything bound to the strand, but it's very easy to imagine that we could conjugate those strand with small molecule, protein, lipids, anything really, and start using this DNA cube as a scaffold to be functionalized and, and to 
basically apply to different applications. So looking at the structure, there has, be, there has been basically a growing interest uh, in using them for drug delivery. And that really comes from the property of the structure. So we know that they are biocompatible, they're degradable, they are soluble in water, which are definitely a very nice advantage. They are quite easy to synthesize. We can, we, we can use the automated DNA synthesizer to make the strands. Uh, they have uh, uh, great control over their size and their shape. And as I just said, they are easily tunable. So we can position ligand very precisely in a multivalent fashion and make them also sequence responsive. So at the time uh, I started my PhD, I guess there was this, this big interest in using the structure as drug delivery system. And there were still a lot of questions remaining uh, into understanding whether they are really compatible with physiological condition. Namely, can they retain their integrity? Can they resist nuclease degradation? Can they go inside cells? Where do they distribute in the body? And, and can they trigger any immune response? And so my, I guess, work at the time really was trying to understand better what happened with the structure and physiological condition. So in terms of structural integrity, very quickly, uh, we can measure the melting temperature using UVV's uh, method. And, and we saw that the melting temperature was above physiological temperature, uh, meaning that our construct will remain uh, a cube when it's injected it at, at physiological temperature. And we also know that when we dilute it into buffer that contain less magnesium than for the assembly, we also retain uh, our structure. So I put here an example of the cube structure in DMEM, which is a, a, a buffer used uh, in cell culture condition. One big question that I think everyone always asks is how this uh, structure resists to nuclease. So if you take your structure and try to do a cell assay or in vivo assay in the blood or in the serum, uh, you'll have a lot of different nuclease, which are enzymes that are just specialized at degrading DNA and RNA. So obviously you want your construct or your therapeutics to be resistant enough to this enzymatic degradation. And what's really interesting is that when we measure the half-life of the strand itself, we have a half-life of less than an hour. However, assembling it into the nanostructures makes it already much more stable. So the structure itself had a half-life of four hours. So without even putting chemical modification, just by assembling it into a structure, you can already uh, make your um, construct more resistant to degradation. And then uh, we decided that four hours might not be enough. So what one extra step that we took was to add uh, hex spacers. So basically these small molecules at the five prime and the three prime end of, of your component strand. And that would uh, basically protect from exonuclease degradation. And we saw that it would increase the half-life even further. And so obviously if we are getting inspired by the oligotherapeutic field, we can imagine that by just simply positioning more and more of those chemical modifications within the structure, it would be very easy to make them resist even longer. Our next question was, can this uh, structure basically go inside cell? And so uh, basically it's a little bit counterintuitive, I guess, because usually unmodified DNA strands won't uh, penetrate the cell membrane very easily. And that's because they are negatively charged and very hydrophilic, but they were hypothesis in the field that maybe assembling it into a 3D structure could trigger new uptake pathway. And so, my work on this was really trying to investigate this quite a lot using fluorescence microscopy and flow cytometry. And I'll make a long story very short, but what we saw uh, at the time was that we had a competition between enzymatic degradation and uptake, meaning that the signal that we were seeing came mostly from the, de the, the degradation of, of our structure, meaning also that we needed to stabilize the, the structure further. So we, we've done that by basically synthesizing the degradation product, making co-localization studies, slowing the degradation by adding some modification and, and doing FRET studies. Uh, but I think my, my big take home message from this study was that we needed more quantitative assay uh, to kind of understand that why we saw so many discrepancy between what the literature reported and what, what we had in the lab. And I think it's very important to mention that 
even though we had challenge and other lab also had challenge, there has been some papers reporting productive uptake. When I say productive uptake, meaning that we can observe a therapeutic effect with the structure in some models. And, and I guess like what it means for us is that we need quantitative and standardized method to be able to really measure the uptake. We need to be able to investigate the structure activity relationship and, and really try to understand why some cells can take the structure and why, how does the shape kind of influence the uptake, et cetera. So that was one of the, the big questions that remain at the end of, of my PhD project. And the, the final thing that I studied was protein binding. So basically we know that if we inject nanoparticle in, in the blood, they don't just like distribute in the body nicely. They first get covered with everything that all the proteins that you have in the blood and form this protein layer uh, that is called protein corona and that can really dramatically influence the PKPD properties of the nanoparticle. And so we thought of this as a potential advantage for us and, and kind of ask the question, can we play with protein binding to enhance the property of nanomaterial and oligonucleotide therapeutic? I'll try to show you the example that I, I did with this for during my research in, in Anadis lab. So we were interested in looking first in albumin. Albumin is the main protein we have in the blood. So it's kind of a, a, an easy first target. It's the carrier for hydrophobic molecules through the body and has been used in drug delivery system for a small molecule to improve stability or reduce immune degradation. And it's one of component of nanoparticle protein corona. So we thought, can we basically try to attach DNA to albumin to sort of change its distribution properties and make it more stable in vivo? And the way we think that we could do that was by making DNA MP5 molecule, which are basically molecules that are made partly of a nucleic acid strand and of a hydrophobic polymer. And so this is the molecule we had. So it's basically a, a nucleic acid sequence where branching lipid units are attached. And we do this by phosphoramidite chemistry. So basically we have this branching unit, C6 uh, chain and C12 chain. And because we do it with phosphoramidite chemistry, you have all this phosphate here uh, that really help uh, preventing aggregation and micelle formation. And so we looked at the binding uh, to albumin and we did different assay. I uh, won't go in, in the details of all those assays, but basically using gel shift assay, surface plasma resonance or fluorescent method, we showed that we had specific and really high affinity binding of the conjugate to albumin. So we are in the nanomolar range. That was quite exciting. Uh, and so then we take, took back the cube that I presented earlier. And what we can do with the DNA cube is really start positioning the, the ligand in the valency that we want. So we can change where it is and, and we can put it at the right number. So we can make all these different version of the cube that carries one, two, four ligand up to eight uh, and try to study if it's binding to the protein or not. You have here a better representation of my early drawing. And so when we do this by gel, we can see that a DNA cube itself wouldn't bind the protein. And that makes sense because both of them are negatively charged and there is really no reason why albumin would bind it. However, when we start positioning the ligand, we see a shift and the formation of, of the complex. So we used surface specimen resonance to measure the binding affinity and so that by tuning the ligand and the geometry, you could change the binding affinity. It's also kind of ex exciting. We then looked at what effect does it have onto uh, stability and activity. So we saw that by binding albumin, we could increase the nuclease resistance by three times. Uh, and that's probably because nuclease can't attack uh, the DNA strand anymore, uh, and that we could retain the gene silencing activity. So we tested both ASO and siRNA sequence and confirmed that they retained their activity inside cell. We also quickly looked into cell uptake. We saw that basically as you're binding albumin, we were seeing less signal inside the cells, and, and we did a, a quite a large study at trying to understand how does that compete with degradation, et cetera. So I invite you to read it uh, if you're interested. And uh, Hassan, who has just graduated from, from Hanadi's lab, uh, was basically investigating this directly in vivo. Uh, so trying to compare with other lipid conjugates. And I'm very excited uh, for, for this, this result. And I'm sure he will be able to present them uh, very soon.
So, but in general, this kind of confirmed that we could use albumin as a way to potentially increase circulation time because it increased the stability uh, of both oligonucleotides and nucleic acid structure, and that putting protein binding domain into nucleic acid structure might be a strategy to improve their properties. And so before I switch to the ne next part, I would just like to have this slide thanking everyone in Hanadi's lab. So first Hanadi for guidance throughout the year. I still felt very lucky to be able to have done my PhD in your lab and along with all those brilliant and, and nice and amazing people that I worked with during my PhD. Um, and so <clears throat> switching to my personal conclusion at the time, what I was seeing is that there is so many opportunities with nucleic acid nanotechnology where you can, as we said, just change the size, the shape, the placement of ligand, alter the protein corona, and do so, so many different things. And at the same time, there were still so many challenges to be addressed to be able to bring nucleic acid nanotechnology to more clinical maturity. And by that, I mean increasing the serum stability, understanding their cellular uptake, their in vivo distribution, being able to develop more quantitative and, and standard method. And I guess as a scientist, this is exactly the place that you kind of want to be or that I want it to be in, where you see so much like possibilities and at the same time, so many challenges where you know that you can have an impact and, and try to solve them. So just uh, really wanted to keep working with this. And I was also very inspired by, by the oligonucleotide therapeutic field that have solved some of this problem, for example, the serum stability uh, or the cellular uptake uh, and was really trying to understand how I could merge all of those expertise coming together and, and bring uh, nucleic acid nanotechnology further in its development. So I had all of this in my mind and I had to find what to do next after my PhD and everything was a bit, I guess, blurry. And I started applying to different job and uh, suddenly on the OTS website appeared an offer from Six Bull Bioscience, which at the time was a very, early on uh, startup company. And so I met with Anna and George online and, and we had a very nice chat and decided to apply to a Marie Curie individual fellowship. Uh, and so I really had no idea that you could apply to join a startup company to scholarship, but I just want to say that it's possible and it's very nice. And so it allows me to really write down my project, uh, what I'd love to do uh, with their help and finding the right collaborators. We were lucky uh, a few months uh, after to be awarded the scholarship. And so I moved to London at the end of the, uh, of the first lockdown and joined the company. And so today I'm just gonna quickly go uh, through what we do and who we are at Sixfold and uh, explain what I've been doing for the past year and a half in the company. So basically, uh, this is a picture of us last summer, I think. Uh, so when I joined the company, we were seven and now we are like 26, 27. Uh, we come from various backgrounds and, and different countries. We are based in London in the White City campus. So just next to Imperial College Department, allowing us to really have very good collaboration. Uh, and Basically, we are a team of mostly PhD and, and a big R&D team uh, coming from, from very different backgrounds. And I think one of my favorite things at Sixfold is really uh, the colleagues that, with who I work because I feel, again, very lucky to work with brilliant and, and very kind and smart people. So now the big question is, what do we do? So the way that we looked at this is when we looked at what the oligonucleotides field as done is really uh, using chemistry to make the oligonucleotides better. So we know that by introducing chemical modification, such as phosphorocyoid modification or tuparometal modification, we can dramatically increase their serum stability. So if we have an unmodified DNA or RNA piece, it will degrade very fast, but by chemically modifying it, we, we could uh, reach stability, allowing to circulate in the body and to have its effect. Similarly, like by introducing chemical modification at the end, like conjugation, we could, uh, I mean, the field was able to 
uh, selectively target some cells and reach to productive uptake and even approved drugs. So we had all of this in mind. And basically, our question was, can we apply some sort of the same principle to nucleic acid structure? So can we play with like chemistry uh, and sort of add it into our structure to make them more robust and, and to also change their properties more easily? And I think what's really interesting here is that we are not really limited to uh, retaining the activity like the sRNA field would do that when you know you add a modification you need to make sure that gene silencing is preserved but here we could start exploring a really really wide space so the way that we see it is that by starting putting chemical modification to change the charge the hydrophobicity the pk the stability of your construct you can start exploring a very big chemical space and and influence the pkpd properties of your construct so by changing those properties very precisely, because now you can position the modification the way you want, you can explore new area, new chemical space, and potentially new distribution or new cellular uptake profiles. So the way that we do this is by making our product, which is called Mergo. It's a programmable nucleic acid delivery system. So basically a self-assemble system made of different strands of RNA. And again, uh, we can assemble this in one pot. You have here an example of one, our Mergo. Uh, and we can load the therapeutic on it. Uh, so we can load sRNA and, and other uh, basically oligonucleotide therapeutic. And so you can see here some AFMH that we do in collaboration with uh, Professor Alice Pine at Sheffield University, where we can see our construct with and without uh, the payload, basically. And same thing, you can attach different number of, of uh, uh, drug molecule. But really what's important to understand is that for us, the core is what dictates most of the properties. So as I said, what we want to do is basically we're making we're exploring the chemical space and we'll have uh, a machine learning team that is trying to understand better uh, how to define this chemical space. Uh, we then make the different block and we use this to make our oligonucleotides with different modification. And we then assemble it and try it in cells and in vivo. And that really allow us to understand what sort of properties do we need to go into one kind of tissue or to go in, in, inside one kind of cell. And so because what we think we're doing when we are putting this modification is basically changing the physical chemical properties we, uh, to basically then change the, the biological property, we're also measuring all of this. So you have on the left side an example of a zeta potential curve where basically we can see that different Mergo system will have different charge depending on the number and the type of the modification that we put. And on the right side, another example where we looked at protein binding uh, and, and protein corona. So here we're trying to understand how does this modification affect how protein come and bind to our construct. And then we test it into different biological fluid, such as human serum or the CSF or brain injection. Very quickly on the in vivo profile, unfortunately, I can't share uh, as much as we have, but I'll show what we can for now. Basically, we haven't seen any like big problem with toxicity. It looks like uh, every, like all our constructs show favorable safety profile uh, and all the mouse were OK. And just an example of what this modification can do. So basically, we can try different modification and try different iteration. And what we've seen is that as we're changing this, we can reach other tissue and go to not only the liver, that was mainly the, the predominant like site of accumulation for the unmodified construct and start reaching tissue that were not accessible without those modifications. So it's quite exciting uh, to see this. And we obviously are looking into more and trying to understand like how we can correlate all the FISCAM properties and the biodistributions that we see. So I'm almost done, but just to say like what we're trying to do is really build a pipeline to be able to study uh, and manufacture uh, nucleic acid structure. And so that uh, basically contains the manufacture of complex and really highly modified strand with non-conventional mod and with its own challenge, uh, being able to develop analytical tool for nucleic acid structure in order to be able to make methods that allow us to quantitatively assess uh, if we make the right product. Uh, a lot of this come from academia so far, so there is still progress to kind of apply it to a more preclinical setting. 
we are making method to look at the physical chemical characterization of the structure, uh, as well as understanding the protein corona and the protein binding profile, uh, which is something quite an explore uh, into the nucleic acid nanotech field. And we are also using machine learning for guiding the discovery of, of this chemical space. So with all of this, I'd like to thank the Sixfold team. This is a more updated uh, photo of us. Uh, as I said, like it's just an amazing team of, of really brilliant people, and I feel extremely lucky to be working with all of them. Uh, I'd like to thank all the, the funding agencies that are supporting our work, and in particular, the European Union that is supporting my grant. Uh, just a quick note to say that we are hiring these days. So if you're interested, uh, you can come uh, and chat to me or look at our website. And I'll be very happy to answer some questions now. Thank you, Aurélie, for this uh, uh, great uh, presentation. So uh, if there are any questions for Aurélie, please use the chat or the uh, Q&A function. Uh, but obviously, I can uh, I can start with a, with a question. and. I think my very first question is, uh, so what you do in the lab, you show that you can uh, build all these uh, very cool uh, DNA uh, nanostructures. So what is the coolest structure that you've ever made? Is it like like an animal or or you just stick with the, with the, with the cubes? Uh, me, I'm a very boring person. I made like mostly like cubes and very simple structure, but I, I'm very jealous of people that makes all these different like amazing, amazing like face and animals and map of everything. So unfortunately, Ronald, I didn't do anything too crazy, but uh, maybe maybe like late, late at night, I could start making my my own little stuff. <laughs> Maybe something for the future, but uh, I also have a more uh, science-related uh, question. So uh, um, I, I think one, one, one of your goals is to uh, to measure the uptake of the uh, of these structures, right? And uh, you mentioned uh, fluorescence. So I, I was just wondering, because uh, most of the times when you add like a fluorescent tag, I think a few things can happen. So uh, one of the things is that this uh, fluorescent uh, tags can... Uh, uh, modify the structures so that you end up with a different structure than uh, that you actually wanted to study. And the other uh, uh, thing that can happen is that this uh, fluorescent text can be uh, cleaved off. So did you take this in consideration or how do uh, how does it exactly work? Yeah, yeah. So uh, in terms of the structure, I haven't seen like that those small die on those big structure usually change too much like the assembly of it. So we were quite safe with that when we checked like and QCR assembly for the die cliff off. That was definitely one of my like biggest nightmare because if I guess if you read my my paper, but that's basically my whole PhD research trying to show that what we were seeing was the die cleaving off from the structure. So obviously there are simple things that you could do. Uh, so instead of having like the phosphate linkage, right? Just stabilizing it with something else uh, could be simple as like a phosphorothyroid, obviously, or like something more rigid. And I think what's important is, is really to start developing methods that are not only based on fluorescence. Uh, and so that are able to, to detect and quantify the, the the RNA inside the cells, right? So obviously in an ideal world when you can measure gene silencing, that's like one thing you could do to confirm you have productive uptake, but you could also lyse the cell and, and rely on other acids that have been developed for, uh, I guess, sRNA or antisense. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking like PNA assay or this kind of stuff that allows you to measure how much you have in the cells. So that's definitely things that we are uh, that were important for me to be developed and that SQL is also working on. Okay, oh, great. Good to hear. Uh, so let's see, uh, I have some a few questions in the chat. So uh, Annabelle Biskens asks, a really nice talk. Uh, could you control the release of the drugs using your uh, NA structures? Uh, yeah, so I think like there is definitely potential for that, right? Uh, and it really depends on the identity of the linker that you put. So uh, I didn't study this a lot, but I think that there is such a variety of linker that have been made, right? I'm thinking of things like antibody drug conjugate or things like that, that have like developed library of linkers. And I think by using this, you could start controlling the release of your drug onto those nucleic acid structures. So that's definitely something that would be interesting to study. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, 
Ja, I, I have another question. Um, uh, it's it's about uh, because what you what you do in the lab is you make uh, uh, especially at the uh, six volt bioscience you make this uh, very small modifications uh, in your uh, 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 ASO. And um, so my question is, if you want to uh, move this forward to the clinic, uh, do you need to go to talk studies for every single uh, modification that you make? Or is it okay if you have like your core molecule and and, and do this? And then the, the follow-up question is, uh, once you figured out a particular uh, uh, modification or a, a series of modifications uh, for uh, one particular uh, particular uh, uh, target, so can you use the same modifications for your second target? Yeah, so right now we're really screening like different mods in terms of number and placement and mix matching them, etc. And, pl and playing with them. So for the second part of your question, like definitely you, you can make the situation. And because it's, you can, I mean, if you imagine like a 500 nucleotide like structure, right? The amount of like position that you can play is just crazy. So that's why we're trying to get the help of like computers and machine learning to sort of help us into our design and understanding what are the key parameters that you need to go to this cell type or this cell type, right? Uh, on the approval, I guess, uh, part, like I, I'm not a very big expert onto that. I assume that yes, like as you have like a, a final like lead candidate, you might have to study what are the metabolites and how toxic they are, etc. So a little bit out of my own expertise, uh, but I assume that that's something that we'll have to look at. But I, I really think like just the same than oligonucleotide therapeutic at the moment, we'll need to understand like what works, right? And then kind of understand what is the toxicity of, of what you've created. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so thanks, uh, thanks for your answer. So there are still a few uh, uh, questions in the in the chat. So mm -hmm. if you uh, please answer, uh, if you can answer the, end, the, the question in the chat, that would be, uh, would be really nice. Um, and then we, and, and if you still, if you can think of any other questions for Oli, please use the, use the chat because I think she will answer this uh, in a while. And then we move forward to the second speaker of today, and that's, uh, that's Leonora. And I think she will also introduce uh, herself. So, uh, Leonora, the, the screen is yours. I can do that. Hold on. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we can see it. Perfect. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, I've been a trainee rep on the OTS board for um, just over a year now, and I recently completed my PhD at McGill University on nucleic acid chemistry, and I've since joined the genetic medicine team at Eli Lilly. Uh, for this webinar, I'm going to be giving a brief review of my PhD work um, in the DOMA lab. And if I can move forward. So during my PhD, I was very fortunate to witness the field of nucleic acid chemistry really skyrocket, especially as you know, most recently with the development of the COVID-19 vaccines. But even before that, the field was already on track to being at the forefront of modern medicine with drugs like uh, antisense uh, oligonucleotides and siRNAs gaining significant clinical uh, relevance over the last decade for showing uh, the potential to treat gene genetic diseases. And then of course, along with that, the delivery technologies that improve the stability and facilitate internalization of these drugs has also evolved. Um, in the DOMA lab, we focused on fundamental research of nucleic acids that may lead to therapeutic relevance. And using chemical modifications, we are able to design and construct molecules, which we can then test for biological applications to identify relationships between our oligonucleotides that we synthesize and the enzymatic machinery associated with ASO's RNAi and CRISPR, for example. So the main catalyst for the rapid development of oligonucleotide drugs has indeed been the incorporation of chemical modifications. And that's because in terms of clinical relevance, natural oligonucleotides have very poor innate drug-like properties uh, for obvious reasons that they're very large molecules. They are highly negatively charged due to the phosphate backbone. And uh, unmodified oligonucleotides are very labeled to nucleus degradation in the blood and tissues, and again, present very unique delivery challenges due to that inability to sort of diffuse across membranes. So through modifications, we can address these issues and make these really non-drug-like molecules behave um, more like drugs. So modifications have been used extensively to improve the drug-like properties of oligos and enhance their delivery. Uh, and uh, usually leading to improved pharmacokinetics and uh, biodistributions. So there's generally three types of modifications that we can study, and those are modifications at uh, the nucleobase, modifications along the backbone, and uh, modifications at the sugar itself. 
So each of these modifications can fine tune the properties of oligonucleotides, usually making them more stable uh, to nucleases and better able to bind to their targets. So for this presentation and in general, modifications at the sugar are particularly interesting because they have a direct impact on the conformation of the sugar uh, ring. And traditionally that's determined whether the modification is more DNA-like um, adopting a south conformation or RNA-like adopting a north conformation. And there's a very strong correlation between the conformation of the nucleotide and the helicity of the duplex. So RNA-like structures tend to form an A-form helix while uh, DNA structures tend to form a B-form helix. And I can show how this can be important uh, later on in the presentation. So the work in my thesis um, mainly pertains to the design and synthesis of new RNA modifications and subsequently the ability of our modified RNAs to help decipher the mechanisms of action of the following two enzymatic systems that I'll talk about, tRNA uh, to prime phosphotransferase or TPT1 and CRISPR-Cas12A. And I've divided the talk accordingly to highlight just uh, some results here. So we'll start with TPT1. Uh, it's an RNA processing enzyme that catalyzes the final step of RNA healing and sealing mechanism that's shown here, where it cleaves the two prime phosphate that's left behind as a product of a tRNA splicing. And it does so via an NAD dependent two step mechanism that's shown here. So the two prime phosphate attacks NAD, uh, kicks off nicotinamide to form this uh, two prime phospho ADP ribosylated RNA intermediate. Um, this then undergoes intramolecular transesterification reaction to reveal functional RNA with a two prime hydroxyl. So our interest in TPT1 comes from the fact that it's uniquely essential for survival in fungi, but appears to be uh, inessential um, for survival in other mammalian and bacterial taxa, presumably because these cells have their own RNA healing mechanism that doesn't produce that two prime phosphate that's necessary for TPT1 function. So since TPT1 is essential, uh, to slicing only in fungi, uh, inhibitors of this enzyme might prove to be extremely useful as selective antifungal agents. And what we're, we were aiming to do here is to design and synthesize inhibitors of TPT1, which should block the growth of fungal pathogens while sparing the human host. So an inhibitor of this enzyme should allow us to also um, hopefully co-crystallize the enzyme with the substrate, uh, and that will ideally provide a lot of insight into uh, the mechanism of action. And um, and other insights as well. So first, to better understand the mechanism of this enzyme, we set out to make some substrate mimics or RNA with a single uh, internal two prime phosphate group and how we went about introducing a single phosphate group at a specific position on RNA strand is by implementing a phosphoramidite with an orthogonal two prime protecting group. Specifically, we use this uh, acetyl-levulinyl ester protecting group shown here. A uh, modality that's been developed in our in the Dama Lab at McGill a few years ago and has since uh, become commercially available. So using this phosphoramidite, in addition to the other four natural RNA for phosphoramidites, we made this 15-mer, 6-mer, and trimer that are shown here. So to synthesize uh, an oligo with an internal phosphate, we optimized this uh, synthetic route wherein um, I grew out the oligo from the three prime end to the desired two prime phosphate monomer location um, using traditional RNA synthesis cycle. And then I introduced that ALE monomer. Uh, but before deprotecting the ALE group, we have to remove the cyanoethyl backbone protecting group so we don't get backbone cleavage. And we do that using triethylamine. And then we use a solution of hydrazine hydrate to selectively deprotect the ALE um, uh, to reveal that single hydroxyl group, which we then, of course, react with the phosphatidylating reagent to get the desired phosphate group. So once that's added, we carry on with regular RNA synthesis until the end of the oligo, after which the oligo is cleaved from the solid support and can be purified, characterized, et cetera. So once we synthesize these substrate mimics, our collaborators in the Schumann lab at the Sloan Kettering Institute uh, carried out several activity assays with TPT1. Uh, and this gel here very clearly shows um, that our substrates are effectively cleaved by TPT1. These are the results for the trimer on the left here and the sixmer on the right. So we notice a faster moving band for the substrate and a slower migrating band for the product. Um, and for the reaction uh, we notice only takes place in the presence of NAD because this is in fact an NAD dependent mechanism. Um, additionally, we learned from titration assays that the extent of conversion from substrate to product is proportional to the amount of TPT1 added and that's what's shown here on the top with increasing concentrations 
uh, of the enzyme and graphically shown here below. So we are very excited by this and proving that we could make uh, successful substrates for this enzyme and study the mechanism a little bit. But obviously our main goal is to move towards more drug-like molecules. So next we look to introducing chemical modifications into our substrates to increase the stability and nucleus resistance of these drugs. Um, first, we tried modifying the sugar at um, all the positions flanking the two prime phosphate groups with such things as DNA, FANA, two primal methyl, fluoro, um, and ultimately thinking ahead uh, towards inhibitors, we look at possible modifications of the phosphate group itself with uh, simple things like changing it to a phosphorothioate to more drastic modifications like the isomer arabino two prime phosphate or the amino or methylene modifications shown here. So the first modification we tested was uh, DNA. And as the graph shows, uh, the two prime phosphate was cleaved with almost identical activity. And we saw similar results for other sugar modifications like the FANA, fluoro, and omethyl at positions flanking uh, that two prime phosphate, perhaps just a little bit slower than the RNA and DNA. And what this told us is that essentially TPT1 doesn't care too much for the two prime region of sugars flanking that two prime phosphate um, that's to be cleaved. For all the modifications mentioned so far, we synthesized both the regular PO backbone as well as the PS backbone. And we found that the PS backbone modifications reduced the specific activity. Um, and at this point, we even begin to observe an accumulation of that ADPR intermediate that I mentioned earlier. Uh, one of the really interesting modifications we tried was changing the two prime phosphate from the ribo position to its arabino stereoisomer, so pointing up instead of down. And interestingly enough, this phosphate group was also eventually cleaved by the enzyme. So this tells us that the enzyme can accommodate the stereoisomer, but it does cleave it at a much slower rate, um, especially step two, since we see this huge accumulation of the intermediate. So circling back to this slide again, all the modifications I showed so far ended up being pretty good substrates for the enzyme, which was good news for us because uh, that means when it comes time to designing the perfect inhibitor for the enzyme, we have a lot of modifications that we can introduce that won't affect the activity of the enzyme too much. But uh, ultimately, we're working towards something that will inhibit the enzyme, and that's where some of these uh, more interesting modifications come in. Uh, for the one on the end here, for example, the sole difference you'll notice uh, between this methylene phosphonate and the original phosphate substrate is that instead of a two prime oxygen, we have a two prime methylene group. Um, and what that does is remove the leaving group that's necessary for that second step transesterification, which releases the two prime hydroxyl group, um, leaving the intermediate essentially trapped. And that's what we're hoping for when synthesizing uh, these compounds. Uh, keeping an eye on the time. Uh, in the next couple of slides, I summarize the synthetic routes we established to synthesize the methylene phosphonate, um, as well as the two prime amino modification. But I feel like in the interest of time, I'll jump over these, um, but just mention that we're very optimistic about, about these modifications and we're excited about the possibility uh, for such substrates for inhibiting TPT1 and then using these modifications in conjunction with some of the more tolerated modifications at flanking positions to create a very effective drug-like candidate. So the monomers of these have been synthesized, but um, not yet put into oligonucleotides. So just to recap uh, some of the things we've learned about TPT1 so far from the enzymatic assays, we learned that TPT1 tolerates modifications at positions flanking the two prime phosphate, which is good news for us, as I mentioned. Uh, modifications at the two prime branch point are tolerated to a lesser extent and backbone modifications like the PS lower the activity of the enzyme. Um, we hope to continue this project with successful inhibitors like the two prime methylene phosphonate analogs which la lacks that uh, two prime hydroxyl leaving group that's required for the TPT1 mechanism and should act as a selective inhibitor for fungal TPT1 and allow us to study the structure of the active site a little bit more. And beyond that, we're excited by all the many opportunities to discover novel modalities at the two prime position to continue exploring small molecule like inhibitors um, of TPT1. So that's TPT1 story. Uh, now for the remainder of the presentation, I'm gonna focus on our second en enzyme of interest, um, CRISPR-Cas12 A. Um, so CRISPR systems, as we know, are showing a lot of promise to provide revolutionary therapeutics. Cas enzymes work by interacting with um, guide RNA to form a ribonucleoprotein complex that's shown here, which is then guided to target DNA via Watson and Crick base pairing with the guide. Um, once the enzyme is bound to DNA, the nucleus domain causes double-stranded breaks 
um, and cleavage of the DNA. And then there's cellular systems that will go in and repair that DNA, often incorporating insertions or uh, deletions, which is ultimately what leads to gene editing. So most genetic diseases would be uh, candidates for mm -hmm. CRISPR. Uh, however, the entire CRISPR system itself is quite large. So there's a few ways you can go um, about delivering it to patients. One way is by packaging the components into lipid particles and directly delivering them that way. But uh, this uh, type of technique requires that the CRISPR RNA be heavily modified so that it can um, last in these environments. So it's important for us to discover which types of modifications and uh, the positions at which we can incorporate these modifications into the RNA. So we've been very fortunate to um, collaborate on various CRISPR projects with the lab of uh, Professor Keith Gagnon at Southern Illinois University for many years now. Um, and together we've learned a lot about the structure function relationships of CRISPR systems. And for this presentation, I'll be highlighting some of um, our findings from one of my projects pertaining to the Cas12A system specifically. So Cas9 and Cas12A are both CRISPR systems that basically induce the DNA double-stranded breaks and guide genome editing. And while the general outcomes are the same, Cas12A um, is different from Cas9 in that, um, for example, it has some of its own distinctive properties like it recognizes a different PAM sequence in the target DNA. Um, creates a staggered double-stranded break instead of a blunt one. And more importantly, for our therapeutic purposes, the guide RNA is much smaller. So only about 39 nucleotides compared to 99 mers for the Cas9 protein. So in principle, modifying it um, should be a bit easier. Uh, where we start to run into problems though, is when we talk about the structure of the five prime portion of, uh, of the guide. It's actually forms a pseudonaut structure that's shown here. Um, um, in purple, and it has important contacts that um, make it sort of not easy or straightforward to predict how we should modify the structure necessarily. So collectively, we turn to the crystal structure to guide our modification designs, um, and also leaned on the fact from previous studies, we found that there's essential two prime hydroxyl contacts that are highlighted here uh, in purple that are um, important. Um, so we turn to modifications that would allow us to uh, maintain some of that hydrogen bonding between the pseudonaut and the protein, and then even probe what removing some of these contacts uh, does. So to investigate the role of the two prime hydroxyl and A form structural preferences uh, in the five prime pseudonaut of Cas12A, we substituted with things like DNA, fluoro, oxypane, arabino, amino, and I've highlighted um, just a few of those results in the, in the upcoming slides. So the first and simplest modification we tried is DNA. DNA obviously lacks that uh, two prime hydroxyl group and is quite flexible. And we know that although it traditionally forms a B form DNA in the presence of enough uh, RNA, it can even accommodate A form. So it allows us to probe A form structure and two prime hydroxyl requirements. So this figure prepared by the Gagnon lab really nicely summarizes some of the in vitro results. At the top, we have our sequence of the CRISPR RNA separated into two sections, um, the five prime handle and the guide region. The legend above shows that we're using yellow squares to represent RNA and blue for DNA, green for two prime fluoro. And at the bottom indicated by these asterisks are the predictive two prime hydroxyl contacts. And then on the right, we see cleavage activity for those respective RNAs. So some important takeaways from these results are that an all DNA pseudonaut has no activity. However, when we maintain RNA at the predictive contacts um, in an otherwise all DNA background, we see a complete rescue in activity. Um, um, next, we studied two prime fluoro, which is a strong A form inducer and a really good RNA mimic, but can't donate the hydrogen bonds. And this modification actually showed really strong activity uh, in vitro when we completely converted the pseudonaut to two prime fluoro. I then synthesized a series of uh, um, of sequences walking the two prime fluoro through the contact positions. And again, the green here represents the two prime fluoro, while the yellow uh, remains RNA. And the vitro assays didn't really reveal too much information here because everything was essentially active, uh, but it's really in the editing activity inside of cells where we start to uncover more um, specific details about these interactions. So looking now uh, in the in-cell cleavage activity of some of these sequences I mentioned so far, when we look at DNA modifications, we see no activity. Um, even when we preserve the two prime hydroxyl contacts, so this suggests that A-form structure is necessary. 
We looked at the series of two prime fluoro modified pseudonauts and found that only when we preserve RNA at the critical two prime hydroxyl position, such as in SJ14, we see more or less wild type activity, which is really exciting. So from this point, I basically designed the remaining sequences around SJ14, preserving the two prime hydroxyl contacts, but walking a new modification through them. And we do see some sensitivity with the two prime fluoro at certain positions like one, two, and seven, which suggests that um, the two prime hydroxyl is uh, probably necessary there. The modification I then set out to try is two prime amino based on the presumption that it's an RNA mimic with hydrogen bonding ability. Uh, and the first set here, we talked, we walked to uh, amino at the contact positions through an all fluoro pseudonaut. And then below we brought back the RNA at those contact positions. And we noticed really similar trends to what we saw for the two prime fluoro where these modifications are really tolerated in vitro. And then in the cell assays show that the more terminal two prime hydroxyl contacts appear to be more sensitive to modifications while uh, fluoro and amino are more tolerated at the central positions. So moving on from amino, we then synthesize another class of modified um, pseudonauts for cas 12 two new series with the goal being to um, identify which modifications at which positions elicit the strongest response of cleavage. So these two new series were more of a systemic study covering two isomers of RNA. So the stereo isomer, um, two prime arabino and the regio isomer, two prime five prime linked RNA. And here are the sequences where again, we want the single RNA isomer modification through each of the seven hydroxyl contacts to observe its effects. And the rest of the sequence remains two prime fluoro, except for the two prime hydroxyl contact. So these are some interesting takeaways from these studies for the two prime five prime series. There is one position, the G at uh, of sequence T146, which seems to tolerate this modification quite well. And similarly for the era series uh, modification at the 18th position on the five prime terminus, there is also well tolerated. Um, in general, era modifications um, appear to be better tolerated than the two prime five prime. So Going forward, some interesting things to consider would be to see if there's a synergistic effect between um, the modifications like T14.6 and A14.1, and if perhaps incorporating these modifications into the same sequence would have an additive effect. And then ultimately the goal is to eventually design an oligo uh, that incorporates only the most effective of these modifications. Uh, finally, we wanted to see if from a structural standpoint, how robust uh, the pseudonaut was, and if perhaps our modifications were disrupting the pseudonaut from forming, because it is a secondary structure, and if that somehow was impacting our results. So far, the key structural aspect we've been focusing on is the hydroxyl contact, but uh, another key characteristic structural feature is the base pairing region highlighted here in gray, which is what actually helps give the pseudonaut its shape. So we want to take a look at how modifying these base pairing regions would impact the stability or structure of, uh, of the pseudonaut. So um, what I'm showing here are some sequences we designed for this purpose um, using simple DNA modifications shown in blue. And um, these sequences either um, spontaneously or through annealing form very stable pseudonauts. And uh, when we look at the Helicity of these sequences by CD, we found that indeed there's a sequence here which very closely resembles the RNA, um, the, the native RNA sequence having a very A form helix. And what's really interesting to observe here is that, um, and that's that one there, sorry, uh, is that a um, cell assay showed that this sequence gave really good cleavage activity as well, while another sequence which didn't adopt an A-form helix showed barely any activity at all. So really this helped uh, confirm the need for, uh, the, for, me, for an A-form pseudonaut. So just to quickly summarize um, this project now, we found that the pseudonaut of Cas12A CRISPR RNA can be heavily modified. The role of the A-form structure and two prime hydroxyl dependency is similar to what we've learned before about the Cas9 guide modification systems and suggest that there's a common theme in uh, CRISPR ribonuclear protein mechanisms. Um, further chemical modifications of the guide RNA can, can probe structure function relationships um, and identify chemistries that are compatible with the therapeutic uses for CRISPR. And um, hopefully the study will give us a better look at uh, Cas12A therapeutics 
Um, that's kind of where I ended off with this project, but it is in really good hands in the Dama Lab. Halle Barber is continuing this project to see um, what uh, other modifications we can put at the five prime handle, but then also extending, extending these into the guide region a little bit. Um, so that's the end of the research part of my talk. I'd like to just completely switch uh, gears here very briefly at the end to talk about my uh, very recent transition from academia to industry. Um, so I just joined uh, uh, Eli Lilly in Indianapolis here uh, as part of the genetic medicine team. Um, and um, just some quick pointers about uh, how to help make that transition uh, a little smoother. So the first and main thing, in my opinion, is to network. Um, I love that this word is being used as a verb nowadays because it really is the act of networking that is so critical when looking for jobs and really prioritizing person-to-person -person connections, especially in this virtual environment. Um, in today's world, I also find it's absolutely critical to generate uh, an online presence for yourself. Uh, if you're in academia, ResearchGate and Google Scholar are great ways to connect um, you to your publications and accomplishments, but I really encourage you to go beyond that because platforms like LinkedIn uh, and even academic Twitter, uh, which the OTS community is very uh, active on, they allow you to connect with your peers and uh, colleagues uh, in the field on a more personal level, and that's what helps generate these relationships. And I can tell you from my own experience for my current job that those initial connections were made via LinkedIn. Um, my current colleagues reached out to me on there and I got to know more about the job opportunities at Lilly in a more informal and organic environment. Uh, and really just look for ways to get involved in organizations uh, in your field. Uh, um, and then another important part of the job search is definitely being proactive. There's so many resources uh, available to you like these webinars, for example, that you can really make use of. Job boards, boards are another good one. The OTS has a fabulous one. And as Orly showed, she herself found her job through the OTS job board. Um, seek out mentors, try and find someone who has done that transition before and seek advice. Even if the person doesn't work in the same field as you necessarily, their experience will still be very relevant and, and helpful. And finally, how you present yourself on your CV is highly, highly important, especially when looking for a job in industry where publications are appreciated, but they don't really tell the hiring team much about how employable you are. You really wanna own your um, transferable skills and highlight the skills you already have and fine tune the CV to, to showcase this. So for example, highlight your teamwork, time management, presentation, communication skills, all of that, and include your specialized skills if it's relevant to, to that specific job. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone who contributed towards the success of the project that I presented on, uh, mainly our collaborators, uh, Keith and uh, Stuart and the, the students in their labs. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank Professor Dama for giving me the opportunity to conduct research uh, through his lab and for being an amazing mentor throughout this time and for continuing to be an amazing mentor even now and being such an instrumental part of my transition from graduate studies to my new role uh, at Lilly and my new colleagues at Lilly for also helping make this transition uh, smoother. So thanks to the OTS for the opportunity to showcase some of my research. Uh, I'm happy to, to take any questions. Got really close there. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, thanks, Leonora. That was an amazing presentation. It was really cool to see such diverse work between your two experiences. Um, while we're just waiting, people feel free to comment your questions in the chat or in the Q and A function. Uh, while we're waiting, I have kind of a naive question. I think. Um, so I was looking at your um, circular dichroism spectra and I was thinking, you know, you found this one structure that really closely resembled um, your control sequence and you had done so much screening. I was wondering if you could make almost a library and kind of screen to identify candidates that match the profile you're looking for, if that would help you narrow down kind of the tests that you have to do. Absolutely. I think that's super important. Unfortunately for that one, it was like very close to the end of uh, my studies. And I even getting those results was like um, amazing in like the little time I had left. So I was really excited by those, but they were super encouraging because when we saw those, we realized we didn't even have to take these necessarily to, to the in vivo studies. We could just do like this kind of pre-screen to see if it's forming that A-form structure because now we see how important it is. 
Um, and if it doesn't, then like maybe don't even don't even bother passing it along um, to the in vivo studies. Because uh, yeah, that disconnect between in vitro and in vivo um, is <laughs> is always frustrating. But uh, having a screen set up like that is is a good way to uh, to key in on some on some key structures. For sure. Great. Uh, Hanati says, excellent talk, Leonora. So proud of you and Orly. Thank you so much. Professor Sleeman was actually on my committee throughout my PhD. So she was a very instrumental part in my sort of self-development too. So thank you, Hanati. Great. Yeah, and anyone who's looking for a position, I know McGill trains excellent scientists. So <laughs> I think you're safe there. Well, uh, we just have uh, Leonora, like she said, she's on Twitter. So is Orly. So if you want to connect, if you have additional questions, you can do that on those platforms. Um, just to wrap up, we have a bit of administrative things. So we actually have an opening for a presenter uh, on April 7th. If people are interested, you can get in contact with Ronald or I or through the info at oligotherapeutics.org. Um, to set up an opportunity to speak. That said, we also have opportunities uh, around the second half of the year. So after June, if you're interested, we have a trainee spotlight series, which features two um, students or postdocs at various stages in their career presenting their work. Uh, and then we also have um, some presentations by established researchers, uh, which alternate weeks. So our first training spotlight series will be April 21st. Uh, and so if we don't have a webinar on the 7th, stay tuned for that. You can check out details on the website. Uh, and that said, you can also go back and watch this webinar. If you missed something, you can share it with your colleagues. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, so I just want to wrap up then and thank uh, Orly and Leonora again so much for your contributions as trainee reps to the board and also for your excellent talks. Thank you guys. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> Thanks everyone.